Hi, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. Today we're continuing our reading from the Arabian Nights, and today we're reading the, the story of Aladdin or the Wonderful Lamp. Aladdin was the son of a poor tailor by the name of Mustafa in one of the rich provinces of China. When he was old enough to learn a trade, his father took him into his own shop. But Aladdin was an idle fellow and loved play better than work. His father died while Aladdin was yet very young, but he was as idle as before, and his mother was obliged to spin cotton night and day in order to support herself and him. One day, when he was about 15 years old, he was playing in the streets with some of his companions. Soon, a stranger who was passing by stopped and looked at him. This stranger was a famous African magician who was in need of a helper. As soon as he saw Aladdin, he knew by his manner and appearance that he was well suited to his purpose. The magician then asked Aladdin's name of some person standing nearby. He crowded in among the boys, placed his hand on Aladdin's shoulder, and said, My good lad, are you not the son of Mustafa the tailor? Yes, sir, replied Aladdin, but my father has been dead a long time. Alas, cried the magician, what sad news. I am your father's brother. I have been away for many years, and now when I have come home in the hope of seeing him, you tell me he is dead. While tears ran down the stranger's cheek, he pulled out a purse and gave Aladdin two pieces of gold. Take these, my boy, he said, and give them to your mother. Tell her that I will come and sup with her tonight. Pleased with the money, Aladdin ran home to his mother. Mother, said he, have I an uncle? She told him he had not. Then Aladdin gave her the gold and to told her that a man who said he was his father's brother was coming to sup with them that evening. The good woman was astonished, but she went to the market and bought provisions and was preparing the supper when the ma magician knocked at the door. He entered, followed by a porter who brought all kinds of delicious fruits and sweetmeats. After the magician had given Aladdin the things he had brought, he saluted his mother and asked to be shown the couch on which his brother Mustafa had been in the habit of sitting. When this was done, he fell down and kissed it several times. Then he said with tears in his eyes, My poor brother, how unhappy I am because I did not come soon enough to give you a last embrace. As soon as they sat down to supper, the magician gave Aladdin's mother an account of his travels. He said he had been away from home for 40 years and had traveled to distant countries. Then he turned to Aladdin and asked his name. I am called Aladdin, said he. Well, Aladdin, replied the magician, what business do you follow? Have you any trade? At these questions, Aladdin hung his head and was much ashamed. His mother replied, Aladdin is an idle fellow. His father tried to teach him his trade, but he did not succeed. Since his father's death, he has done nothing but idle away his time in the streets. With these words, the poor woman burst into tears, and the magician turned to Aladdin and said, This is not well, my nephew. You must think of some way of earning a living. I will help you in any way I can. Shall I take a shop and furnish it for you? Aladdin was overjoyed at the idea, for he thought there was very little work in keeping a shop. <clears throat> he told his uncle this would suit him better than anything else. I will take you with me tomorrow, said the magician, and clothe you as handsomely as any merchant in the city. Then we will open a shop. Aladdin's mother thanked the magician very heartily and begged Aladdin to behave so as to prove himself worthy of the good fortune promised by his kind uncle. Next day, the stranger called for Aladdin as he had promised and led him to a merchant who sold ready-made clothes. Then he had Aladdin try on the handsomest suits and bought the one that he liked best. The pretended uncle then took Aladdin to visit the bazaars where the foreign merchants were and in the evening gave him a feast. When Aladdin's mother saw him return so handsomely dressed and heard him tell of the company he had been in, she was full of joy. Generous brother, said she to the magician, I do not know how to thank you enough for your goodness. May you live many years and have my son's gratitude. Aladdin, replied he, is a good boy. I have no doubt that some day we shall both be proud of him. I am sorry that I cannot hire the shop for Aladdin tomorrow, as it is Friday, and all the merchants will be absent. So I will come to take Aladdin and show him the public gardens outside the town. The next morning, Aladdin got up very early and dressed himself. Soon he saw his uncle coming and ran to meet him. The magician greeted him very kindly and said, Come, my good boy, today I will show you some very fine things. Then he led him through, then he led him through beautiful gardens with great houses standing in them and by degree led him on farther and farther in the country. At last, seeing that Aladdin was tired, he bade him sit down by the side of a great basin of pure water. He also gave him some cakes and fruits and told him to eat them. By kindness and pleasant talk, he led Aladdin to go much farther until they came to a narrow valley with mountains on all sides. This was the place that the magician had hoped to reach. 
He had bought, brought Aladdin for a secret purpose of his own. We shall go no farther, said he to Aladdin. I shall show you some wonders that no one besides yourself will ever see. I am now going to make a fire, so gather all the dry sticks and leaves that you can find. There were many dry sticks scattered about, so that Aladdin soon gathered more than enough. The magician lighted a fire, and as soon as it was in a blaze, he threw some perfume into it. A dense smoke rose, and the magician spoke some my mysterious words. At the same instant, the ground shook and opened near the spot where they stood. They could see a square stone about a foot and a half across with a brass ring fastened in the center of it. Aladdin was frightened out of his wits and was about to run away when the magician suddenly gave him a blow in the ear and knocked him down. Poor Aladdin trembled with tear and with tears in his eyes got up and said, Dear uncle, what have I done to deserve so severe a blow? <clears throat> I have good reasons for it, replied the magician. Obey me and you will not be sorry for it. Underneath that stone is a treasure which will make you richer than many kings if you will do what I tell you to. By this time, Aladdin was over his fright and said, What must I do? Tell me, I am ready to obey you. Well said, replied the magician. Now come and take hold of this ring and lift up the stone. <coughs> Excuse me. To Aladdin's surprise, the stone was raised <coughs> Excuse me. without any trouble. And then he could see a, a small opening three or four feet deep. At the bottom of this was a little door with steps that led down still lower. Now, said the magician, you must go down into this cavern. When you come to the bottom of the steps, you will see an open door leading into three great halls. In each of these, you will see four vases as large as tubs full of gold and silver, but you must not take, but you must take care not to touch any of it. When you come into the first hall, take up your robe and bind it around you. Then go on to the second hall and from there to the third. Above all, be very careful not to go near the walls, nor even to touch them with your robe. If any part of your dress should, should chance to touch them, your instant death will be the result. At the end of the third hall, there is a door that leads to a garden full of beautiful trees covered with fruit. Go straight on and follow a path that you will see. This will lead you to the bottom of a flight of 50 steps, at the top of which there is a wall. When you reach the wall, you will see a shelf on which there is a lighted lamp. Take up the lamp and put out the light. Then throw away the wick and the oil and put the lamp in your bosom. Then bring it to me. If you should wish to gather any of the fruit in the garden, you may do so. There is nothing to prevent you from taking as much as you please. When the magician had given these directions, he took a ring from one of his fingers and gave it to Aladdin, telling him that it would protect him from any evil. Now go, my child, said the magician. We shall both be rich for the rest of our lives. Aladdin leaped into the opening and went down to the bottom of the steps. He found the three halls exactly as the magician had said. He passed through them with the greatest care for fear of being killed. He went on to the garden and climbed to the wall. He took down the lamp, emptied it, and put it in his girdle. Then he started back but stopped in the garden to look at the fruit. The trees were all full of the most wonderful fruit. Some were white and others sparkled like crystals. Some were red and some green, some blue and some violet. The white were pearls. The sparkling kinds were diamonds. The red were rubies, the green were emeralds, the blue were turquoises, and the violet amethysts. In short, all the fruits were precious stones, and they were larger and more perfect than any that had ever been seen in the whole world. Aladdin was not yet old enough to know their value and thought they were all only colored glass. However, their beautiful colors pleased him, and he gathered some of each color and filled both his pockets as well as the two new purses that the magician had bought for him. Loaded down in this manner with the immense treasure, Aladdin hurried through the three halls in order that he might not make the magician wait too long. Having passed through them with the same caution as before, he began to ascend the steps. Soon he reached the entrance of the cave where the magician was waiting. As soon as Aladdin saw him, he called out, Give me your hand, uncle, and help me up. My dear boy, replied the magician, first give me the lamp so that will not hinder you. It is not at all in my way, said Aladdin, and I will give it to you when I am out. The magician still insisted on having the lamp before he helped Aladdin out of the cave, but the lamp was covered with the fruit from the trees, and the lad could not easily find it until he got out of the cave. This threw the magician into the most violent rage. He threw a little perfume upon the fire which he had kept burning, and he had hardly pronounced two magic words before the stone returned to its own place and shut up the entrance of the cavern. Aladdin did not expect such a wicked action by his supposed uncle after all his kindness and generosity. 
He was more horrified than can be told. When he found himself buried alive, he called a thousand times to his uncle, telling him he would give him the lamp. But all his cries were useless, and he remained there in perfect darkness. At last, he dried his tears and went down to the bottom of the stairs, intending to go into the garden. But the walls, which had been opened by enchantment, were now closed. He felt all around him to the right and the left, but could not find the least opening. Then he sat down on the steps and redoubled his cries and tears. Aladdin remained here for two days, without eating or drinking. On the third day, feeling that death was near, he clasped his hands in prayer and said in a loud voice, There is no power but in God. As he joined his hands, he began to rub the ring which the magician had put upon his finger. As soon as it was rubbed, a genie of enormous size and terrible appearance rose out of the earth before him. What do you wish? said he to Aladdin. I am ready to obey you as your slave. I am the slave of him who wears the ring on his finger. Frightened almost out of his wits, Aladdin cried, Whoever you are, take me out of this place. Scarcely had he said it when he found himself on the outside of the cave at the very spot where the magician had left him. He rose up trembling and made his way back to the city. When he reached his mother's door, he was fainting from hunger and fatigue. His mother, who was heartbroken because he had not returned, received him joyfully and gave him food and drink. Then he told his mother all that had happened to him and showed her the lamp and the colored fruits and the wonderful ring on his finger. However, his mother thought little of the jewels, and as she was ignorant of their value. Aladdin hid them beside, behind the sofa while his mother bewailed the wickedness of the magician. When Aladdin awoke next morning, his first thought was that he was very hungry and would like some breakfast. Alas, my child, replied his mother, I have not a morsel of bread to give you. You ate last night the last bits of food in the house. However, I have a little cotton of my own spinning, and I will go and sell it and buy something for dinner. Keep your cotton, mother, replied Aladdin, and give me the lamp that I brought with me yesterday. I will go and sell that, and the money I shall receive will buy us food for breakfast and dinner. Aladdin's mother took the lamp from the shelf where she had put it. Here it is, she said, but it is very dirty. If I polish it a little, perhaps it will sell for more. Then she took some water and a little sand to clean it with. But she had scarcely begun to rub this lamp when instantly, and while her son was present, a horrible genie rose out of the ground before her and cried with a voice as loud as thunder, What do you wish? I am ready to obey you as your slave. I am the slave of those who have the lamp in their hands. Aladdin's mother was too terrified to speak, but Aladdin, who had seen a genie in the cavern, seized the lamp and answered in a firm voice, <clears throat> I am hungry. Bring me something to eat. The genie disappeared and returned in a moment. He carried on his head a silver tray on which were twelve silver dishes filled with the finest food. There were, all, there were also six silver plates and two silver cups. He placed them all upon the table and instantly disappeared. When Aladdin's mother had recovered from her fright, they both sat down to their breakfast in great delight. Never before had they eaten such delicious food or seen such fine dishes. This feast provided them with food for several days, and when it was all gone, Aladdin sold the silver dishes one by one and bought more food. In this way, they lived happily for a number of years, for Aladdin now behaved with great wisdom. He took care to visit the principal shops and public places, and in this way grew to be very wise. One day, as he was walking in the city, Aladdin heard an order of the sultan telling all persons to shut up their shops and go into their houses until Princess Baldru Badrubadur, the daughter of the sultan, had passed by on her way to the bath. Aladdin hurried along with the crowd of people until he found himself in the doorway of a large building. He placed himself behind the door where he was certain not to be seen and where he might see the princess as she passed. He had not long to wait before she came with a great crowd of her attendants. As she passed, she threw aside her veil, so that Aladdin saw her face. She was indeed the most beautiful princess he had ever seen, and he fell in love with her at once. When Aladdin told his mother of his love for the princess, she laughed and said, Alas, my son, what are you thinking of? You must have lost your senses to talk so foolishly. Mother, replied Aladdin, <clears throat> I have not lost my senses. I am in my right mind. I knew very well that you would think me a fool, but whatever you must, may say... Nothing will prevent me from asking the princess in marriage from the sultan. <clears throat> Truly, my son, said his mother, you seem to have forgotten that your father was but a poor tailor. <coughs> Excuse me. Indeed, I do not know who will dare to go and speak to the sultan about it. You must go yourself, said he. I, <clears throat> cried his mother in great surprise. I go to the sultan? No, indeed, I will take care not to do anything so foolish. 
You know very well that no one can make any request of the Sultan without bringing a rich present, and where shall poor folk as we find a present? <clears throat> then Aladdin told his mother that while talking with the merchants in the shops, he had learned to know the value of something that they owned. For a long time, he had known that nothing that they had in their shops was half so fine as those jewels he had brought home from the enchanted cave. So his mother brought them from the place where they had long been hidden. Together, they arranged them in a fine porcelain dish. The brightness and luster of the gems and the variety of the colors so dazzled their eyes that they were astonished beyond measure. Aladdin's mother was sure that her son's present was one that could not fail to please the sultan, so she agreed to do as her son wished. She took the porcelain dish with the jewels and folded it up in a very fine linen cloth. Then she set out and took the road to the palace of the sultan. The grand vizier, accompanied by the other viziers and proper officers of the court, had already gone in when she arrived at the gate. The crowd of those who had business at the court was very great. The doors were opened, and she went in with the others. She placed herself so that she was opposite the sultan and other officers. After the various persons had been heard, the sultan and his court retired without anyone taking the slightest notice of Aladdin's mother. Day after day, the good woman went back until at last her patience touched the sultan's heart. One day, he sent for her and asked her what she wanted. Trembling, Aladdin's mother told him of her son's request and begged the mercy of the sultan for him and for herself. The sultan heard her kindly and then asked her what she had so carefully tied up in the linen cloth. Then she unfolded the cloths and laid the sparkling jewels before him. It is impossible to express the astonishment of the sultan when he saw the jewels in that dish. For several moments he gazed at them speechless. Then he took the present from the hand of Aladdin's mother and exclaimed, How very beautiful! How very rich! My good woman, I will indeed make your son happy by marrying him to the princess as soon as he shall send me forty large basins of gold full of the same kind of jewels that you have already presented to me. They must be brought to me by an equal number of black slaves, each of whom shall be led by a white slave, all richly dressed. Go now, my good woman, and I will wait till you bring me his answer. Full of disappointment, Aladdin's mother made her way home and told her son the sultan's strange wish. But Aladdin only smiled, and when his mother had gone out, he took the lamp and rubbed it. The genie instantly appeared, and Aladdin commanded him to lose no time in bringing the present that the sultan had requested. The genie instantly disappeared, and soon returned with forty black slaves, each carrying upon his head a heavy tray full of pearls, diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. Each basin was covered with a cloth of silver, on which were flowers of gold. All these slaves, with their golden basins, entirely filled the house as well as the court in front and a garden behind it. Aladdin's mother almost fainted when she saw the great crowd and all the jewels, but Aladdin asked her to follow the slaves to the palace and present his gift to the sultan. No sooner had the first slave turned into the street than every idle person ran to look, and by the time the whole procession was on its way, the crowd was so great that everyone had to stand in the place where he happened to be. When the first of the eighty slaves arrived at the gate of the palace, the porters were in great haste to open it. When the sultan had been informed of the arrival of the slaves, he gave orders to have them admitted. They entered in regular order, one part going to the right and the other to the left. After they were all within the hall and had formed a large semicircle before the throne of the sultan, each of the black slaves placed the bas basin that he carried upon the carpet. Then they all bowed down until their foreheads touched the ground. The white slaves also did the same. Then they all got up and uncovered the basins which were before them and then remained standing with their hands crossed upon their breasts. The astonishment of the sultan at the sight of all these riches can hardly be imagined. After gazing at the shining heaps of jewels, he said to Aladdin's mother, Go, my good woman, and tell your son that I am waiting with open arms to welcome him. Aladdin was so delighted with this news that he could hardly answer his mother. He hastened to his room, shut the door, and having called the genie, he ordered him he ordered him to take him instantly to a bath. When he had been bathed and perfumed by invisible hands, he was dressed in garments that shone like the sun. The genie also brought him a splendid horse and twenty slaves to march on either side of him on the way to the sultan's palace. All carried purses of gold to scatter among the people. If there had been a crowd before, there was ten times as great a one now to watch Aladdin as he rode past and to pick up the gold pieces which were scattered in the street by the slaves. The sultan came down from his throne to greet him and there was great feasting and joy in the palace. The sultan asked Aladdin if he wished to remain in the palace and be married that day. 
Aladdin replied, I beg you to permit me to wait until I have built a palace to receive the princess. I request you to point out a suitable place for it near your own. My son, answered the sultan, there is a large open space before my palace, and you may take whatever spot you wish. But remember that, to have my happiness complete, I cannot see you united too soon to my daughter. Aladdin then took leave of the sultan and departed. As soon as he, as he reached his home, he lost no time in again calling the genie. He commanded him to build a beautiful palace on the spot of ground given by the sultan. Early the next morning, the genie appeared. My lord, said he, your palace is finished. Come and see it. Come and see if it is as you wish. Aladdin found it far more beautiful than even he had hoped for. Words cannot tell the astonishment of the sultan and his household at seeing this wonderful palace. The marriage of the princess and Aladdin was held the same day with great rejoicing. For several months there was nothing but happiness, but there was soon to be an end of it. Aladdin had become very fond of hunting, and there was not a week that he did not go out to follow the chase and sometimes at a long distance from the city. About this time, his old enemy, the magician, found out by some of his magical arts that Aladdin was enormously rich and much beloved instead of being dead as he had supposed in the enchanted cave. He was filled with rage and immediately set out for China. On arriving there, he went to one of the great merchants and began talking about Aladdin and the wonders of his palace. In this way, he learned that Aladdin had gone a-hunting and was not expected home for several days. The magician bought a dozen shining new lamps and put them in a basket and set out for Aladdin's palace. When he came near it, he called out, who will change old lamps for new ones? This brought out a great crowd of people, for they all thought he was foolish to give his bright new lamps for old ones. When he came under the princess's window, all the slaves laughed as they looked down into the street. Come, said one of the slaves, let us see if the old fool means what he says. There is an ugly old lamp on the shelf. Maybe he will give a new one in its place. The princess gave her consent, and away ran one of the slaves with the lamp to the magician, who willingly gave in exchange the best he had. As soon as night arrived, he called the genie of the lamp and commanded him to, tra to transport him, the palace, and the princess to the farthest corner of Africa. The order was instantly obeyed. The grief of the sultan was terrible when he found that the palace and his daughter had disappeared. Soldiers were sent in search of Aladdin. Aladdin was soon found and taken to the sultan. He would have been beheaded if the sultan had not been afraid of the people by whom Aladdin was much loved. Go, wretch, cried the sultan. I grant you your life, but if you ever appear before me again, you will be beheaded unless within forty days you bring me tidings of my daughter. Aladdin left the palace not knowing which way to turn his steps. At length he stopped at a brook to bathe his eyes. As he stooped down, his foot slipped, and to save himself from falling, he pressed the magician's ring, which he still wore on his finger. The genie of the ring appeared before him, saying, What would you have me do? O mighty genie, cried Aladdin, take me to the spot where my palace now stands. Instantly, Aladdin found himself beside his own palace, which stood in a meadow not far from a strange city. The princess was then walking in her own chamber, weeping over her misfortune. Happening to look out of the window, she saw Aladdin and made signs to him to be silent. Then she sent a slave to bring him in by a private door. The princess and her husband, having kissed each other and shed many tears, Aladdin said, Tell me, my princess, what has become of an, of an old lamp which I left on this shelf? The princess then told how her slave had exchanged it for a new one. She also said that the tyrant in whose power she was always carried that lamp in his bosom. Aladdin was sure that this person was no other than his old enemy, the magician. After, ta after talking a long time, they hit upon a plan for getting back the lamp. Aladdin went into the city, and having changed clothes with a wayfarer, he purchased a powder that would cause instant death if it was swallowed. The princess then invited the magician to sup with her. As she had never been so polite to him before, he was delighted with her kindness. While they were at the table, she ordered a slave to bring two cups of wine, which she had prepared. After pretending to taste the one she held in her hand, she asked the magician to change cups, as was the custom between lovers in China. He joyfully seized the goblet and drank the wine which contained the deadly poison, and soon fell senseless. Aladdin, who was hiding nearby, snatched the lamp from the magician's bosom and summoned the genie, who instantly carried the palace back to the place from which it had come. A few hours after, the sultan, who had risen at the break of day, went to the window to look at the place where the palace had been. To his great joy, he saw Aladdin's palace shining in the sun. He called his guards and hastened to embrace his daughter. 
During a whole week, nothing was to be heard but the sound of music and feasting in honor, in honor of Aladdin's return with the princess. Not long after this, the sultan died, and Aladdin and the princess ascended the throne. That's the end of that story. I'll see you tomorrow with the Enchanted Horse. Bye-bye.